they were, they were the mother, stepchildren, blended children, because society has changed so much. And it brings with it all kinds of social issues and social problems, which I won't even go into here tonight. Uh, but the Antichrist is trying everything he can to destroy uh, the family. Uh, because if he can destroy the family, what he destroys is order in society. He destroys the order in society. One of the reasons we're having so many problems in this country is because of the destruction of the family. Uh, most families are dysfunctional, meaning they don't function properly. Most families in our culture are, are ran by single parents. Uh, usually it's the mother without a father being in the house or children grew up with two or three fathers in the house. Now there's nothing they can do about it, so you can't blame them other than the fact they gotta suffer whatever the consequences from being in a dysfunctional kind of structure. I told somebody today that even with all of the dysfunction, the only thing that can save us is the power of the Holy Ghost. That's one of the reasons why the Holy Ghost was sent to turn this thing around uh, and to heal us and to save us before it's everlasting too late. That next slide, Brother Kevin. Uh, and if you just kind of follow along with me and, and try to follow the, the, my voice as we move uh, in here. The gospel is the only thing that can save us. You, saints of God, you got to know this. The gospel is the only thing that can save us. David Platt, in his book, Counterculture, listed a whole number of things which he said was destroying society. That's what this next slide talks about, those things that's destroying us in a major kind of way. Uh, and I listed them last week. We're going to rush through them real quick. If you got a pencil and paper, you can write it down. Uh, for you who do, do uh, talking to other people, do some of you even do a little teaching. Uh, some of you uh, do very well in Sunday school. These are the kind of things you need to know as you do your conversating. Uh, these are the things that are destroying the culture. Same-sex marriage, the thing is completely out of control, out of control. Abortion is another issue that has really played havoc on this culture. Racism has played havoc on this culture in a major kind of way. Pornography has played major havoc on this culture in a major big type of way. He goes on to talk about the other issues that are destroying the society in which we live in. The homosexual agenda, promiscuity, illegitimate birth, cohabitating. People don't even marry no more. They just live together. Uh, and you, unfortunately, you end up with uh, Christian people who at one time put so much emphasis on marriage end up in cohabitating kind of situation. Humanistic psychology destroying the culture. When people do what they want to do, they got their own personal philosophy. They don't care nothing about order, morals, or anything. The high rate of divorce. Uh, we live in a Hollywood kind of society where everybody and probably will end up being married two or three times. Now, if this is any of these things that happened to you before salvation, you know, you don't sit there and, and cry over it. The Lord has delivered you from it. But we must know these things so we can help pull others out of these things. The gun culture in this country, with the culture of crime, you know this is completely out of control. Completely out of control. Uh, saints, and, I, and, and I'm not gonna go into no discussion about guns because saints will say ain't nothing wrong with no gun and uh, guns don't kill nobody, people kill. And I know all of that, but it's the crime that's related to the culture of gun toting and gun carrying that's really, really destroying us in a major kind of way. You live in a country where every time you hear pop, you almost gotta be scared because you don't know if it's a gun or yes, somebody busted a balloon. Feminism, this is one of the earliest um, infractions on culture in the Bible with the invention of Jezebel and her spirit of taking over, trying to take over the kingdom. Uh, and that spirit is very pervasive in the times in which we live in today. The culture is lacking all kinds of stability. It's destroying itself from the inside out. If you don't believe the Lord is on his way back, then you got to get back to church on Wednesday night and pray and tarry, because he's trying to tell us and Jim Titus 2 and 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world because the world is out of control. I talked to a man today who told me he was caught up in uh, Kai, uh, this, this new money system that they're trying to work through on the internet, a cripo currency. Uh, it, it's a really a step towards one world finances. 
Uh, and as he was talking to me about it, lady walked past and just happened to hear us talking about it. And she said, leave that alone because that is not right. And I said to him, she even knows something was wrong with it. But we're moving to that society. We're moving to that culture where the Antichrist shall rule the whole world in every way possible, religiously, socially, psychologically, financially, economically. So the culture is both pervasive with this stuff that's spreading among us and invasive is taking over us. And mankind is on the brink of a future that is separating us from the very foundations which gave us normalcy and spirituality and which created this unit that God called the family, which was supposed to hold the whole culture together. And it really has not. We have come to this place. Churches have all kind of power, uh, but it don't have the power that it had before. And, and maybe I'm saying that the wrong way. Maybe I'm saying we don't use the power that was given to us to use. The elephant in the room is the power influence of the internet. I always say this, that if you want to see the workings of the devil, the workings of the enemy, the workings of the Antichrist, look at social media, is capturing our time, corrupting our children's innocence, reshaping the way we learn, the way we think, is the source of our needs. But the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We live in a new secular age dominated by these principles and teachings of the Antichrist. And these are all anti-biblical foundations. The Antichrist agenda, he want to destroy the church. Get that in your head. He don't want the church to be what the church was intended to be and what it used to be. He's trying to destroy the family, as I'm saying now. He don't want the family what it should be because it, when the family is strong, society tends to be strong. He's trying to destroy the individual. That's you. He don't want you to look up towards heaven for your guidance and your leading. He wants you to depend totally on yourself. And that's what's happening where individuality and individualism have taken the place of the village and nobody listens to anybody hardly anymore. And then you wanna take over the state. That's what the uh, Cairo, Cairo currency is all about, taking over the state. President Trump, I think I said it last week, first president in the history of the United States of America, which is supposed to be the most democratic country ever in the history of the world. He almost took over the United States of America and he would have definitely led it in a way that totally different than what we see today. He destroys the church. He's trying to turn us from the will of God. This is how he destroys the church. He try to turn you from the word of God. He's trying to turn you from the cross and the blood. And then what he's always done is try to deny the supremacy and superiority of the name of Jesus. Church is not what it used to be. Christianity is not what it used to be. Uh, because Satan has an intro uh, and, and got involved in the church and trying to destroy the church because if he can destroy the church, he can destroy the structure of the church. Brings us to this whole marriage according to the Bible. Because if, if family is the center, then marriage is the center of the family. While teaching in the temple, Jesus was asked this strange question about who's going to be married to who in resurrection. The Sadducees posed the question to him, trying to trick him up. But Jesus made very clear his concern was not with marriage and the resurrection, but in marriage in the times in which we live. Marriage in this country is down. People wait to get married much later if they do get married. People divorces are up. People will divorce over anything, drop of a hat, un incompatibility, uh, not enough money. Uh, and, and the Bible gives grounds for divorce, but we have taken it to the stream where we divorce in this country for anything. Uh, and, and like you can sue anybody for anything, you can get a divorce for anything. But that's not what God intended. God is against divorce because it destroys the family, but he knows given human nature because of the hardness of men's heart that it happens. It happens. It happens in the church sometimes. Uh, but he regulates it while permitting it under certain circumstances, and he allows remarriage when the correct order is followed. Uh, last week, I talked about radical forgiveness, and I don't know if I did a good job of trying to explain it, 
But in the interval this week, while I was watching uh, the, the, uh, the installation of the presider of the Church of God in Christ, the installation message was about radical holiness. It appears that everybody is using the term radical. I didn't even know this. Uh, and radical forgiveness is one of those things that's tied into this, this culture of marriage because if we do not have the ability to forgive, to forget, to tolerate, to compromise, uh, to uh, love beyond what is almost humanly possible, we will help to destroy what God created and that was the family. I've listed a number of scriptures here. And if you want them, we can come back to them. A godly marriage is a marriage that is instituted by God in the first place. It is a marriage that God himself institute. Uh, marriage is not firstly between an individuals, but it's between God first. When the individuals stand in front of the priest and it's the church that had to sanctify the marriage, you can just walk up to somebody and say, we're going we're gonna to get married today. We married now. The Lord, when he created it, it was to be instituted through the church and it was to be regulated through the church. In, in any words, you just can't do anything you want to do. Of course, we live in a different society. People write their own vows. They take out the vows that came from the Bible and put their own words in. Uh, and they uh, end up creating something that God never really created. Uh, God's whole emphasis was on the fact that the husband was to leave his mother and his father and cleave unto his wife. Every man must symbolically leave his house and of his father. That actually meant that he led, he gave up uh, thoughts that he had in that house. He, his psychology changed. Uh, he had to then con confront the chaos of, of his individual being. And then he had to discover the values that most rightly fit him so he could leave his house. Now, what has happened, especially in our culture, our families have been so dysfunctioning until there's no man to leave his father because he didn't, he wasn't raised with his father. And women end up, unfortunately for them, they end up marrying men who never left the house never left the complete home because they didn't have one. That's how the devil has destroyed the family. And from generation to generation, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. But God created marriage and he created for the stabilization of society and for the stabilization of human beings. He told Adam in the garden, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna make you a helpmate. And that was so that Adam would become more stable uh, so that Adam would have, wouldn't have to deal with aloneness, uh, so that Adam would have somebody to assist him, to help him uh, in being the man that God really wanted Adam to be. Marriage is about companionship. It's about the reality of commitment, truth, and trust. Those three words, commitment, truth, and trust. You've got to know them three words because somewhere in the marriage is going to get so rough, so tight, until if you don't have a commitment to God first, and you don't have a, a truth about what you feel in terms of scripture, understanding scripture, understanding the will of God and trust, then the whole thing can fall apart because it hinges on commitment, trust, and truth. Uh, one of the reasons God said until death feels part because it takes a lifetime for us to actually create in our relationship commitment, truth, and trust. You've got two individuals who are different than each other in totality. They come from probably dysfunctioning backgrounds. Uh, they probably married for many of the wrong reasons because they the commitment hadn't been made to the Lord first. Uh, some people marry for money. Some people marry because their friends marry. Uh, some people marry because they're just lonely. Uh, because if there's no commitment, no truth, no trust, all of that other stuff, when it finally wears away, you're going to be in a very vulnerable state that the devil can come in and take advantage of you, destroy your home, destroy your families and what have you. Characteristic of a decent marriage is, and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit next week, 
but the, some of the characteristics is the time that the individuals must spend with each other, getting to know each other. Again, it takes a lifetime to get to know your mate or your partner. Uh, people get married, they tell me, that sociology says that after five years, six years, seven years, the things get a little tested. But according to the word of the Lord, five, six, seven years, is just the beginning of getting to know each other. Uh, that commitment to the Lord should have kicked in by that time. I guess I should say that in the first place, you don't marry anybody who don't love the Lord. Uh, and, and how would you know they love the Lord? Well, it takes time for you to get to know them to know if they love the Lord. You can't just jump into a relationship because you met somebody, they appear to be very friendly, being very warm, because people can put up the biggest facade you ever did see. Uh, other other uh, co commitments to this marriage thing is maturity. You don't want to marry nobody who's not mature. I said last week about sorry men and silly women. Sorry men are those who don't work, who take care of themselves, self-centered, selfish. The silly woman is a woman who tells all of her secrets of her living room to all of the people who live in her neighborhood. She don't have enough sense to realize that what happens in her house is important to her house, her family, her children, her husband. Uh, spiritual emphasis is always important. You don't want to marry somebody who don't love church. If they don't love church, you got problems. Now they might have problems and they do love church, but marriage to a saint of God, the spiritual emphasis becomes very important. Intimacy is not just sexual intimacy, but that intimacy about trust, security, and privacy, uh, trying to take care of another individual, uh, negotiating, ability to tolerate levels, to compromise and to have those kind of social skills that can combat any pathology. It takes a long time to get there. I guess the bottom line is that when you love somebody, it takes time actually to fall in love and you don't fall in love, you gotta walk in it. If you fall in love, you break your leg, make some break somebody's legs too. Then our last thing that I put is radical forgiveness. Because I was trying to say, and probably did a poor job to stand it, that if you can't forgive and even forget like Jesus did, then you're going to have trouble in, in any kind of relationship that you're in. Because total holiness, as they said at the Church of God in Christ installation, that is radical. It breaks through that which is normal. And then when God's will is his restoration, of course. Now, now let's go to that page that you put up first, Brother Kevin. Um, I think it's the 19th one. Uh, yeah, there we go. The divine order for the family. Here is the order here. This is according to the word of the Lord. God is the head of the man. Man is the husband. God is the head. Every man who calls himself the head of his house, got to remember that God comes first in this house. Now, sisters, you might be married to a man who might not be the most vocal spiritually, but if he loves the Lord God and he's trying to do the will of God, and I underline the word trying, then you want to do everything you can to support that because you almost can't find that anymore in the times in which we live in. The man is the head of the woman because the Bible said so. Bible said it. He is to protect his family. He is to lead his family. He's to provide for his family. He's not a sorry man. The wife then acknowledged the headship of her husband as Christ acknowledged the headship of the church. Her job is to comfort her husband, to support her husband, to teach her husband and her children Sometimes the greatest lessons that men learn is from a godly wife. And then to nurture her husband. Uh, because of the pressure that Adam was under, after, especially after they fell from the garden, he needed a whole lot of teaching and a lot of nursing. And he could only get it from Eve. It wasn't nobody but them too to start with. So he could only get it from her. So she had to nurture him. Uh, sometimes it said the women raise their husband. Well, it might be some truth to some of that. And then the last element here is the children, because from this union comes children, which continues the stability of the family. And the parents are to love the children, and the children are to obey the parents, 
uh, and how do parents love the children? By teaching, it goes back up the ladder, by teaching, by, by nourishing, by comforting, teaching them how to respect God, his church. We live in a time now where children don't even know how to respect the house of God. They don't even, they, when we were coming up, of course, and I, and I hate to try to use us as an example. When I say us, I mean my generation. If your daddy and mama went to church, you went to church. If your daddy and mama didn't go to church, they sent you to church. And when you went to church, you learned the morals, you learned the values. We got saints who children don't come to church. And I'm talking about the younger ones. I'm not talking about the older ones because by the time they got a little older, she just automatically be in them. Uh, Ephesians fifth chapter is an excellent chapter to read if you wanna hear more about wives and husbands. Now women sometimes get hooked up on the verse that says, wives submit yourself to your own husband, obey your own husband. You don't have to get hooked up on that because it counterbalances. Because then it, it says that the man's job is to love the wife and then to make sure she's taken care of because that's how love is created. You love anybody that's taking care of you. The husband is the father. He's the provider. He's the leader. He's the priest of that house. He's the protector, the teacher, and he's the disciplinarian. This is the order that God set up in the Bible. Now, we live in a society where this order don't work as easily as it did work in the past, but because it don't work, what we're seeing is defunct, dysfunctional family. Why do we have Bible class like this? So that we can make a difference, especially those that's just starting to raise children and those who are just freshly getting married or those who get married for the second time or third time who need to get it right this time. Okay, but the husband, that's his job. Sisters, when you're looking for someone to marry and the Bible says that it's when he finds a wife, he finds a good thing, which implies that maybe you don't need to look or don't need to look that hard because when he approaches you, you wanna apply these standards. Is he a leader? Is he a, a priest? Priest is one who leads the spiritual miss of the house. Her role, she's the helpmate, supporter, the confidant, the partner. Every Adam needs a confidant. He needs to be able to talk to Eve and know that Eve is gonna keep it next to her heart. But we live in a society now where Eve, soon as Adam tell Eve something very personal, very private, Eve go and tell the woman next door. Sometimes it's the worst thing you can do. Uh, it's her job is to fulfill the needs of her partner. Now, helpmate means whatever you need help to do. Uh, never in competition should a husband and a wife be, but in completeness of, they should create a team. But we live in a society now where you have husbands and wives who are competing against each other in their own houses. You don't compete, that God put him there in charge and then you are there to support him. Now, if he got a good sense, areas that he's weak in, he'll make sure that he uses Eve to cover him. And Eve, the areas she weak in, she know that she got Adam, he got her back. But if you sit around fussing and fighting and arguing and in competition, I can do this better than you and I know what to do too and I, I don't need you, you know, you destroy your own house. The wife is the administrator. This is according to Proverbs 31, 13 to 27. That means that her mind is the business headed one. She sees, let me make canned goods and put them up for winter because he's so busy working that Adam don't even realize we got to not just rev them in the summer, but we got to figure out what we're going to eat in winter. But Eve already being a minister and a business minded woman don't put the stuff aside so when the snow comes, she just goes and gets the stuff she don't put aside. Adam didn't even know that she's putting it aside. Uh, she manages the household. She makes sure that the house is kept holy. She makes sure that she follows the instructions that comes from Adam and uh, this is what Adam want his kids to be like. This is what he expects. We, we at church every Sunday. She then does everything she can to help that priest bring about that stuff. She's thrifty and industrious, according to Proverbs 31, 13, 27. She don't spend every dime that he brings on. She don't. She, she knows that let me put some of this up 
because we're going to need something. He might be just as, as crazy when it comes to money as it can be. But the, And how does she get, this, get these kinds of qualities? Well, sometimes she's born with them. She might not have them, but she prays that God give them to her because she wants to be a wise woman. She teaches values, rules, and order for her children, and she's an intercessor. She prays it. A good mother, when Adam is snoring in the middle of the night, good mother, mother wake up at 2 o'clock, get up and walk through the house to make sure all the kids are there. He sleep, no, no, they ain't there until the morning when he wake up, and then he got to beat somebody half to death for not coming home. But not Eve. Eve gets up in the middle of the night. She anoints the house. She prays with the house, and she going back to sleep. And he don't even realize that she's been the interceder the whole time. That's her role, according to the scriptures, according to the holy word of the Lord Jesus Christ. The traditional family model, it's a patriarchal household, which means uh, whether it's like or not, the times we live in, God created for Adam to be the head, and he created for Eve to support him and to walk beside him. Now, some people say she's supposed to walk behind him, but I contend that when all things are equal, she walks beside him by walking behind him or vice versa. The father's viewed as the center of the household when possible. That's why marriage becomes important. Now, that is not the diminished role of the matriarch. Many of us have been raised by strong women and women who had to be strong because the patriarch was weak as water. Bible said Reuben was named Reuben because he was weak as water. But this is what God intended for things to be. Uh, we have uh, had a number of young men come to our church, and we always tried to teach them to be patriarch of their families when they marry. Seven deadly threats to your marriage. One is lust. It will destroy every relationship. When you get married, that means that the person that you with is the only person you're supposed to be with until death do you part. But again, we live in, in a society and we live in a situation where lust will destroy a household in a drop of a hat. Uh, two, selfishness, self-centeredness. Marriage is about giving and sharing. Anything else leads to isolation and aloneness. One of the things that destroys marriages very quickly is, is financial concerns. When you got two people living in the house, husband and wife, and they can't seem to come to agreement about this is ours, you got major trouble. But when this is mine and that's yours, trouble is afoot. Some kind of way you got to sit down and figure out God blessed us with this, this is ours, and we got to do the right thing. Uh, selfishness, self-centeredness will destroy marriage every time. Uh, laziness, marriage takes energy to commitment and emotional connection. When that's not there, when there's no energy, when the person, because when, when, when a person don't feel love, they feel abandoned uh, and they end up feeling completely unloved, it creates tension in the relationship. Anger and bitterness is a threat. A lasting relationship requires forgiveness, and I use the term again, radical forgiveness and radical grace, and sometimes uh, radical love, uh, because we human beings, we make terrible mistakes. Uh, we make mistakes, and then we destroy the person from making mistakes when we making the mistakes. Envy, competition, ungrateful and unthankful, and, and sharing this with your spouse. Listen, you don't have to live in an envious situation with your husband or your wife. They belong to you and you belong to them. What they get, you get. Whatever, whatever accolades they receive, you automatically receive. But we walk around so many times in competition, ungrateful for what we have, unthankful for what we got, uh, and then we share this with the spouse. The spouse, the spouse then feel threatened, feel like they're not adequate or sufficient, and then it creates the tension between the two, and it destroys the relationship. It takes a good one, take two good ones to somehow put it back together and keep going. That's why I go back to that radical part of the relationship when through come hell or high water, you know, because of the love we have for each other. 
we, we will sustain ourselves. Pride stunts the process of growth, causing us not to take responsibility and to blame the other. Because if you get into a situation where you're blaming the other one almost all the time for everything that go wrong in a marriage, it ain't gonna last. Take the responsibility for your own setbacks, your own issues. They takes two people to create trouble in a marriage situation. Seven, constant discontentment, constant unhappiness, constant complaining, constant comparing. You two against the world, you're like nobody else. You're powerful within yourself. Now you might not got the money that the people next door got, or you might not have the education the people across the street got, uh, but you have something between the both of you and if you constantly is in a state of discontent, it creates unhappiness in your relationship. It creates complaining and comparing. Never compare yourself with nobody else. You are who you are. Now let me end by talking about these relationship rules that are golden. Trust leaves one with a sense of comfort and support. Trust your companion. Ask God to help you trust him. When I say trust, I'm not talking about the little things that we do. I'm talking about that uh, trust that is proverbial. It just comes with a relationship. Do, is, is your companion perfect? They're not perfect and they're never going to be perfect. But you know what? Neither are you. Now, they might have done things worse than you have, but you got to realize that you have been sent there to help them through. Understanding needs, feelings, changing constantly, not taking advantage of a person's weaknesses. You know, so you know that they're weak. Your, your companion is weak in some area. You don't take advantage of it. When you love somebody, you try to help them work through it. Fighting fair, no name calls, threats, derogatory behavior, no keeping score. You hit me, so I'm gonna hit you back. Well, in the first place, ain't nobody got no business hitting nobody, whether male, male or female. But fighting fair I means you don't go around calling your, your, your uh, it, that's 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 verbal abuse. You don't go around calling your partner names. Of course, she don't look like she looked when you first married her, but you don't either. You know, the things that you had that was your power was back in the day, they're gone. You see, so you don't keep no score. And then there's this sense of humor that you must keep and not take things too personal, plus it's debilitating. Because if you start thinking that everything that's done is done against you, then you're creating an environment in the house where there is no love, no trust, aloneness, abandonment, and it destroys that situation totally. Now, what kids need to see in a household, if nothing else, they need to see a mother and a father that love each other. Because no matter what is, they could be poor as they can be, but when they see their mother and their father together, they can do anything. That's why kids who grew up in homes where the mother and the father only went to the eighth grade ended up doctors and lawyers and scientists and engineers and what have you. Things to build on. And this will end us up for tonight, I'm thinking here. This is our last slide. Sharing. Marriage has got to be built on two people who share just about everything. You know, now everybody's an individual and you got the right kind of mate, they will allow your individuality and not try to dominate you or control you. Wish we had time to talk about that control and that domination. You know, we start out, we control and dominate and we're jealous because we're young. But as time go on, you have to control nobody you love or that love you. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. You need to be loyal to each other. This is your husband, not the woman next door. This is your wife, not the guys on your baseball team. So you want some loyalty. You, you want loyalty from them, but you need to be loyal to them. Learn the how to apologize. Uh, we live in a society that children are not caught, taught how to apologize. They don't know how to say, I'm sorry. And so what happens when they get older, if they didn't learn it, they don't grasp it and that concept just goes over their head and they end up in divorce situation because 
somebody won't say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, or I did that, I shouldn't have done that, please forgive me. And that's when radical forgiveness got to kick in, because at that point, you won't forgive them for nothing, forget you. But radical forgiveness goes to the cross and says, I will die for you, even though I shouldn't. And of course, I'm not talking about you literally dying. I'm talking about Jesus dying for you. Show some appreciation. Be thankful for what you have. Nobody have what you have. Show some pre Say, I thank you. And then live by the 60-40 rule. That is 60 for you and 40 for me. Because my job is to take care of you, make sure that you're happy, make sure that you got some freedom to be able to spread your wings and move around and grow while you are doing everything you can to lift me up and hold me up. It creates a solid society in which we live and we marry. Now, of all this stuff, especially for those who are marrying or thinking about marrying or trying to think about getting out of marriage, all this stuff is to help us as sanctified people that we'll build upon what God has given us so we can have a strong life, a strong condition. Let me end up by saying that these people who died in this situation down in Florida, some of them had been married for 59 years, 40 years. Some of them had went to bed uh, and they never woke up, but they was with each other because that's what love does for you in a marriage situation. It takes you to the very end. And I wanna say, let us pray for that situation. It is really horrible and horrific what has happened down there. There's 30 different theories to how come the building came down. They don't know how they are. Everybody's starting to throw blame around. But let's remember the people who are left uh, and, and thank God for that uh, there are those that are left. And maybe we can even learn. We got one life. It will not last us forever because this is not eternity. It's just, it's a slither in front of eternity. We got somewhere else to go beyond this. And the Lord's trying to get us ready for that now. That's the last slide uh, tonight. Uh, I'm wondering that anybody got any questions or any comments tonight. We're in good time. Uh, we didn't go over our time. Questions. Oh, good, good lesson, Pastor. 